colleagues, students, friends of the Africana Latin American Studies Program, welcome to the 10th WEB and Shirley Graham Boys Lecture. Unfortunately, we've had a dreadful day, but I thank you for bringing the weather, the elements, and uh, coming out this evening. In previous years, we have been able to attract high class scholars to deliver these lectures, albeit mainly African Americans. And last year, for the first time, we began to include scholars who specialize in other areas covered by the whole Africana and Latin American Studies programs. And so last year, we had the now Caribbean historian Hilary Beckles. Uh, this year, we have our, our distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Kwame Alki Tapia. And hopefully, next year, we will be able to bring a distinguished Latin American scholar. Since last year, we have linked the Du Bois Lecture with a new event, Africana and Latin American Studies Day. But after this week's dreadful weather, we probably have to think having it in February. <laughs> you may have seen some of the banners and posters in the news and so on around the campus. Africana and Latin American Studies Day is designed to promote the visibility of the program on the campus and in fact beyond and to celebrate the achievements and cultures of the people of the areas that we study in the program, Africans, African Americans, Latin Americans, and the people from the Caribbean. We began last night with a hugely successful talent show featuring some of our most talented students who did all kinds of things on stage at the, at the palace. And throughout today, there has been a series of events, all of which hopefully have drawn attention to the program. This evening's lecture will be the crowning event of Africana and Latin American Studies Day. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the students who participated in various events, both last night and during the course of today. Without them, none of this would be possible. Special thanks must be extended to the various businesses in the village of Hamilton who offered donations and prizes to, um, to the government, to the Women's Studies <coughs> Center, who not only kindly allowed us to use their space this morning, but also provided breakfast for us. And a very special thank you is reserved for Pat Kane and Sylvia Smith, who worked tirelessly in the planning and execution of the entire series of events, and making sure that there were no embarrassing pitches. <laughs> Now, although the Du Bois Lecture is a key part of Africana Latin American Studies Day, it always does require separate attention and planning. <clears throat> and I especially would like to thank Professor Mary Moran and indeed the African Studies faculty who worked assiduously to bring our distinguished guest speaker for this evening's lecture and who also organized for sponsorship for various, <clears throat> for various units within the university. And I will I will allow uh, Mary to thank them in her own way. I now have the pleasure to invite Professor Moran to share this evening's proceedings and to introduce our distinguished speakers. Kwame Anthony Apia grew up 
in the city of Kamasa, Kamasi in Ghana, the capital of the Asante Kingdom, to whose royal house he is related. A child of British and Ghanaian parents, he was educated at Cambridge University, where he studied philosophy and received BA, MA, and PhD degrees. He is taught at Cambridge and at Yale, Cornell, Duke, Harvard, and Princeton universities, holding positions in philosophy, literature, and African and African American studies. He is currently the Lawrence S. Rockefeller University Professor of Philosophy and in the University Center for Human Values at Princeton. His early work in philosophy concerns the foundations of probabilistic semantics, published as Assertion and Conditionals by Cambridge University Press and For Truth and Semantics <coughs> at Whitehouse, and Necessary Questions, an Introduction to Philosophy, published by Prentice Hall. He has received wide acclaim for his 1992 book, In My Father's House, Africa and the Philosophy of Culture, which has sometimes been used as a response text for uh, Core 152, very cool. Um, his, he continued his exploration of race, philosophy, and history with Color Conscious, The Political Morality of Race, published by Princeton in 1996, and The Ethics of Identity, published also by Princeton in 2005, and the new, newly arrived Cosmopolitan, Ethics in a World of Strangers. Um, a forthcoming book, Experiments in Ethics, based on a 2004 series of lectures at Bryn Mawr College, will be coming soon from Harvard University Press. He's also produced many edited books, including a major series on African American writers, and the Encarta Africana, uh, co-edited with Henry Louis Gates, which is a massive CD-ROM interactive encyclopedia of things African and, and uh, African American, and which also has a hard copy version. Um, and the number of his essays and review articles on topics as wide ranging as art and aesthetics, African religion, literature, philosophy, um, would uh, fill a book, many books of their own. Um, and in addition to all this, among his literary works are three novels. And in collaboration with his mother, the writer Peggy Appiah, an annotated collection of 7,500 proverbs <coughs> in the Tui language of the Asante people. He has been recognized for this outstanding body of work with numerous awards, including, just to mention a few, the 1993 Herskovitz Award from the African Studies Association for the best work published in English on Africa for In My Father's House, the Ralph Bunch Award from the American Political Science Association for the best scholarly work in political science which explores the phenomenon of ethnic and cultural pluralism for color conscious, and both the Editor's Choice Award from the New York Times Book Review and the Amazon.com Best Books of 2005 Top 10 Editor's Picks for Nonfiction for the Ethics of Identity. <coughs> Clearly, someone who ranges widely across the, all the possibilities for, for speaking to a broad group. Um, and among his many honorary degrees from educational institutions all over the world is one from Colgate University in 2003, which I have just learned he cherishes so much as to have a picture of our swan on the pond as a screensaver. <laughs> Dr. Apia comes to us today to deliver the Du Bois lecture on the topic of Du Bois. Uh, his title is Du Bois and Cosmopolitanism, and he will consider the philosophical foundations of Du Bois' thinking, exploring the ways in which his writing was shaped by the context of his time, what Dr. Apia has called the burden of his and our scholarly inheritance, the concept of race. In chapter two of In My Father's House, Dr. Apia writes, in his early work, Du Bois takes race for granted and seeks to revalue one pole of the opposition of white to black. The received concept is a hierarchy, a vertical structure, and Du Bois wishes to rotate the axis, to give race a horizontal reading. Challenging the assumption that there can be an axis, however oriented in the space of values, and the project fails for the loss of presuppositions. In his later writings, Du Bois whose life's work was, in a sense, an attempt at just this impossible project, was unable to escape the notion of race he explicitly rejected. We may 
may borrow Du Bois' own metaphor, though he saw the dawn coming, he never faced the sun, end quote. Um, and so now please join me in welcoming Dr. Rabia as he takes us further towards the sun on this snowy day, Dr. Kwame Anthony.
was won only after the NAACP had fired Du Bois for a second time. In fact, when Du Bois heard of the Brown decision, he said, which is not something that anybody on the board of the NAACP would have said, I have seen the impossible happen. As for the Pan-African Congresses and conferences he attended, they never did much more than provide a platform for fine speeches, except perhaps to add to the voices already formidable Rolodex. And nearly 50 years since he finally established its secretariat in Accra in 1961, his Encyclopedia Africana is still far from finished. Du Bois's institutional bequest to the world was, to put it bluntly, negligible. What made Du Bois famous was not the life he lived, but the words he wrote. Henry James's response to the book his brother William sent him was to call the salt of black folk quote, the only southern book of any distinction published in many a year. That's not the most forehanded compliment you ever heard, but it's a compliment, nevertheless, from a critic with enormously high standards. More perhaps than any American, certainly more than any African-American before or since, Du Bois was famous as an intellectual and as a writer. The constant stream of poetry, drama, biography, fiction, long and short, monographs, letters, autobiographies, symposia, and newspaper and journal articles can seem frankly overwhelming. Herbert Atnecker, Du Bois's literary executor, published an edition of Du Bois's work and his formidable correspondence that runs to some 50 volumes. Uh, not only did he write constantly in every genre, this remarkable author's credentials as a scholar were among the most distinguished of his generation. He began his intellectual career at Fisk, because a black college was the right place for an African-American, however smart, especially one of modest means, who depended for the cost of his education on the philanthropy of strangers. But his achievements there were impressive enough to allow him to take his Fisk BA at Harvard, and he earned a second bachelor's degree there two years later in 1890, cum laude, and was chosen to give one of the four commencement orations at Harvard. A year later, he had a Harvard MA in history, working under the tutelage of Alfred Bushnell Hart, one of the founding fathers of modern historical studies in the United States. James had suggested, uh, William, not Henry, had suggested that philosophy would be a more chancy academic career, but his philosophy teachers fragged his spirit in uh, form all his later writings. Du Bois went on to study at the Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin, at the apex of the German academic system that had recreated the university by inventing <coughs> modern graduate education. There he studied with the cultural historian and philosopher William Diltai. He listened to Max Weber and Heinrich von Kreitschke, the Prussian nationalist historian of modern Germany. And he deepened his knowledge of the Hegelianism that he had learned from George Santayana in Harvard. When he couldn't raise the funds to complete his doctoral degree in Germany, he returned back to America and to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Du Bois is one of the few people for whom one can say Harvard was the second best. <laughs> His doctoral degree was the first granted to an African American by Harvard University. This was one of his many firsts. Two years later, he'd been appointed professor of classics at Wilberforce University, a black college in Ohio, at the age of 26. By 1895, nearly three years before his 30th birthday, W.B. Du Bois had two bachelor's degrees, an M.A. and a Ph.D. His first book was his history thesis on the suppression of the African slave trade, which was also, as it happens, another of those firsts, the first dissertation to be published in the Harvard Historical Monograph series by anyone, black, white, yellow, or brown. In 1896, he the year that he published this pioneering historical monograph that spans two centuries of Atlantic history, the author left his job as a classics professor at Wilberforce to begin a sociological study at the University of Pennsylvania of the African-American community of downtown Philadelphia. Du Bois hadn't liked Wilberforce University much, but he had met and married Nina Goma, a student there, so he could hardly regard those brief years in Ohio as wasted. Three years later, Du Bois published his second book, The Philadelphia Negro, which is another of those first. It's the first modern scientific study of an American community. And it was the author of The Philadelphia Negro 
that Max Weber was to come to visit. By the time the Philadelphia Negro was here, however, Du Bois himself was no longer a Philadelphia Negro. He had become one of those Georgia Negroes, riding Jim Crow in Atlanta. He'd taken the job as professor of history and economics at Kentucky University, one of the crop of southern black colleges that sprang up in the years immediately after the Civil War. Founded in 1865 by the American Missionary Association and supported by the Freedmen's Bureau, by the turn of the century he was educating black teachers to meet the growing needs of the segregated schools of the South. The University of Pennsylvania, and Franklin's institution, was willing to harbor his research, but in the 1890s, it couldn't offer a black man a job as a professor. Du Bois was to spend more than a decade in Atlanta, editing the Atlanta University Studies in the Sociology of Afro-America, organizing conferences, teaching and conducting research, research that shows up with the detailed knowledge of the rural South that you will find on display in the cells of black folk. Atlanta University was where Du Bois lived out his vocation as a professor. And all the time he was writing. The preface of the Souls of Aquos, with difficult individuality, he called it a forethought, is signed Atlanta, Georgia, February 1st, 1903, three weeks before his 35th birthday. One imagines that on February the 2nd, he finished the next work. When he wasn't writing or teaching or doing research, he was busy helping to found organizations of racial uplift. In 1897, he founded the American Negro Academy. In 1900, he attended the Pan-African Conference in London. In 1905, he helped organize the opening conference of the Niagara Movement, whose aim was both to ensure black voting rights and, above all, to oppose the Petit Washington's accommodation to segregation. But these institutional efforts of Du Bois's were largely community, as I've said. Pan-African Congresses trickled on through the century, the Academy was to last barely a few decades, and the Niagara Movement had four conferences and disbanded in 1910. That movement did pave the way, however, for the creation in 1909 of the National Negro Committee, which was to become the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. And it was the NAACP that took Du Bois back out of the South in 1910 to edit its official magazine, The Crisis, in New York City, and to direct the organization's publications and research, though not before he had added a new Nora to his beta by uh, publishing his impassioned biography of John Brown. He was sporting too, a professor with a curriculum vitae and a list of publications and awards unmatched among African Americans and equaled by very few white academics. Now this scholar in his prime had a national platform on which to speak for the Negro. And he did so there for the next quarter century until he resigned in one of his famous fits of indignation in 1934, at an age at which most people would have been contemplating a peaceful retirement. Mr. Boyce, at his reputation, had 30 productive years to go. He returned to Georgia to share, chair the sociology department at Atlanta University. Within the year, he established his place as a major American social historian by publishing Black Reconstruction, which remains the most important thing in the subject. He started a new journal, Philo, and of course he published more books. And he wrote more letters. When he was forced to retire from Atlanta University in his mid-70s, he went on working, writing newspaper columns, starting the Encyclopedia of the Negro. In the years after the Second World War, like many progressive Americans, he campaigned for nuclear disarmament, chairing the Peace Information Center, and attracting inevitably, the attention of Senator McCarthy and his friends in Washington. He tried and acquitted in his 83rd year on charges of being an unregistered foreign agent. He was denied a passport by the State Department anyway, <coughs> and so he was unable to accept Kwame Nkrumah's invitation to attend Ghana independence. Only as he entered his 10th decade did the Supreme Court finally <coughs> rule in Kent v. Dulles that denying American citizens the right to travel because of their political opinion was unconstitutional. Du Bois applied for a passport and promptly went on a triumphal world tour. He went back to the University of Berlin, now renamed for Wilhelm von Humboldt, its founder, and received an honorary degree as an arts artist. He traveled to Europe on both sides of the Iron Curtain. He met Christov in Moscow, Mao, and Zhou Enlai in Peking. By the time he received Nkrumah's invitation to come to Ghana again in 1960, this time to celebrate on independence, but the final separation from Britain 
was done and became a republic. The boy from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, denied a new passport by the American embassy in Accra, became a citizen of Ghana, of that African nation. On the eve of the Great March on Washington in August 1963, he sent a telegram of support to Martin Luther King Jr. and the marches. The boy died that night on August 27, 1963, five years short of a century old. The telegram of congratulation and the telegram announcing his death were both read the vast crowd gathered on the mall in Washington. Du Bois had always had a flair for the dramatic. His state funeral in Accra was one of the great public events of the modern British time. No one, of course, came from the American embassy to represent the country of his birth. Oh, well, that's the man who wrote the song of Black Hole. And what a paradoxical figure he is. He was an elitist and a dandy who developed the notion that African-American community should be led by what he called the talented tenth. But he was also a socialist in the 1930s, and he became a member of the Communist Party in Ghana when he was more than 90 years old, without ever ceasing to be either a dandy or an elitist. He was profoundly committed to literature, poetry, art, and music, writing movingly in Dusk of Dawn and coming to know Beethoven and Gardner, Titian and Rembrandt when he came to Europe, and declaring that, quote, art is not simply works of art, it is the spirit that knows beauty, that has music in its soul and the color of sunsets in its head and cheeks, that can dance on a flaming world and make the world dance too. But he also said that all art is propaganda and never must be, despite the waning purists. He wrote that his people were, quote, Americans not only by birth and by citizenship, but by our political ideals, our language, our religion, but he claimed membership to, in a black race, that transcended nationality. And in the end, his love of race and his disappointment of America, with America led him to renounce his American citizenship and take up with the new nation of Ghana. In disentangling at least some of these paradoxes, one finds, I think often in Du Bois, echoes of his deep immersion in the philosophical tradition that shaped the German world of the late 19th century, the world in which he received his earliest graduate education. So I want to suggest today how exploration of some of these German sources helps illuminate the most often quoted sentence in the Psalms of Black Folk, the one that begins the second essay of the Dawn of Freedom. You know it, I'm sure. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea. Du Bois first offered this formulation in his speech to the nations of the world at the first Pan African Conference, organized by the Trinidadian uh, Henry Sylvester Williams in London in 1900. Not one to waste a good line, Du Bois used it in the first paragraph of the four thought of soul as well, this time, though, without any explanatory gloss. In his first use of this resonant formula at the Pan-African Congress, in the context of a discussion of the exploitation of the non-white world by European empires, Du Bois had said this. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of color line. The question as to how far differences of race, which show themselves chiefly in the color of the skin and the texture of hair, well, hereafter, we made the basis of denying to over half the world the right of sharing to their utmost ability the opportunities and privileges of modern civilization. <coughs> this context is hugely important. The soul is about black life in America. But when he prefaces his discussion of reconstruction in the American South with a remark about the place of black people, not in America, but in the world, when he insists in the first essay of our spiritual strivings that, quote, Negro blood has a message not just for America but again for the world, Du Bois displays tendencies absolutely fundamental to all his thinking. It is these tendencies, deeply rooted in the intellectual legacy of German culture, that I want to go on to explore with you today. So let's begin with the passage on the second page of the soul, where he places the Negro in global context. After the Egyptian and the Indian, he writes, the Greek and the Roman, the Teuton and the Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son. <coughs> now, the Souls of Blackfoot was meant for 
precisely the wide leadership it eventually received. He knew that he couldn't take the American general public through an academic discussion of what he meant by the word race. He knew that he lived in a world that largely took it entirely for granted that God or science that determined that humankind was composed of races, that white Americans were of one race, Negroes another, and Chinese and Japanese a third. But if we're to understand how he himself was thinking about these things, we have to turn back to the discussion of these issues at the second meeting of the American Negro Academy, which I mentioned earlier, uh, um, a talk on the conservation of races, which was published as the second of the Academy's occasional papers in 1897. Du Bois' style in the conservation of races is as florid as usual, but he avoids some of the poetry that we find in the souls of black folk. And so we can see a little more clearly some of the assumptions of work. The question we must seriously consider, he argues, is this. What is the real meaning of race? And he answers first that, quote, the final word of science so far is that we have at least two, perhaps three great families of human beings, the whites and Negroes, possibly the yellow race. What matters about these races that science has discerned is not what he calls the grosser physical differences of color, hair, and bone, but the, quote, differences, subtle, delicate, and elusive, though they may be, which have silently but definitely separated men into groups. There's a sort of video paragraph now. While these subtle forces have generally followed the natural cleavage of common blood, <coughs> descent, and physical peculiarities, they have at other times swept across and ignored these. At all times, however, they have divided human beings into races which, while they perhaps transcend scientific definition, nevertheless are clearly defined to the eye of the historian and sociologist. What then is a race? It is a vast family of human beings, generally of common blood and language, always of common history, traditions, and impulses, who are both voluntarily and involuntarily striving together for the accomplishment of certain, more or less vividly conceived, ideal life. <coughs> the boys considers then that once we look with the eye of the historical sociology, there are three, but eight, distinctly differentiated races in the sense in which history tells us we must use the word. The three came from science, the eight come from history. They are, I'm quoting now, the Slavs of Eastern Europe, the Teutons of Middle Europe, the English of Great Britain and America, the Romance nations of Southern and Western Europe, the Negroes of Africa and America, the Semitic people of Western Asia and Northern Africa, the Hindus of Central Asia, and the Mongolians of Eastern Asia. And all these nations are striving, each in its own way, to develop for its civilization its particular message, its particular ideal, which shall help guide the world nearer and nearer that perfection of human life for which we all long. What the voice is insisting on is, in fact, Count racial or national membership that is focused on ideas, or as you might say, principles, expressed in the collective life of a people. And in insisting on this, he's thinking about national history in the way that it would have been taught at the university in Berlin. It was, after all, the standard understanding of Hegel's philosophy of history that human experience was the working out of an idea, in fact, of something called the idea in history. In the less metaphysical version of the story that the voice borrows not from philosophers but from historians, nations are the historical expressions not of one grand universal capital I idea, but of slightly less grand particular ideas. The English nation, the English nation stands, Du Bois says in a perfectly conventional formulation, for constitutional liberty and commercial freedom. German for science and philosophy, the Romance nations for literature and art. The voice then is searching for the Negro idea. The full complete Negro message of the whole Negro race, he says, has not as yet been given to the world. The question is, how shall this message be delivered? How shall these various ideals be realized? The answer is plain, by the development of these race groups, not as individuals, but as races. Only Negroes inspired by one vast ideal can work out in its fullness the great message we have for humanity. Now, no one who's read Herder's 781 Ideas on the Philosophy of the History of Mankind will fail to recognize in Du Bois all the elements of the literary nationalism of the philosopher of the Sturm Graham. As Charles Taylor 
there, as pointed out, Herder applied, quote, his conception of originality at two levels, not only to the individual person among other persons, but also to the culture bearing people among peoples. Just like individuals, a folk should be true to itself, that is, its own culture. End quote. So there is, in the tradition on which Du Bois is growing, uh, this tradition that this great believer in personal individuality is growing, there is no difficulty in stressing the importance as well of the, of the development of race groups. To speak in the more flowery language of individuality that we inherit from Romanticism, your being a Negro should shape the authentic self whose expression is the project of your life. For Hara, every nation has a distinct governing spirit, its Volksgeist, a word one might naturally translate as national soul, which is expressed in every aspect of its social and cultural life. So the character of each nation can be found not only in the writings of its literary geniuses, in Goethe and Helderly, but also in its folklore, the folk songs and folk tales collected, for example, under head of inspiration by the Brothers Grimm, whose folk tales you may have been read in China. Herder would have understood exactly why Du Bois prefaced each chapter of Souls and Backbones with a literary epigraph and with a phrase of what he called the sorrow songs. Negro spirituals were the folk song of Afro-America. Du Bois' implication of his intellectual legacy is hard to avoid once this background is drawn to your attention. It is, after all, there in the title. He is showing his readers the geist of black folk. For Herder, as clearly for Du Bois, each folk's guise possesses something of distinctive value. And one of Herder's claims about historical method is that we must recognize how different the inner life of different peoples is. Nevertheless, Herder equally fervently insisted, thus mentioned Geschlecht ist ein ganzes, humankind is a single thing, a totality. Indeed, part of the providential point of history is that each people, each folk should express its distinct character through its history, because it's only through each nation's following its distinctive path that history as a whole can achieve its meaning. It's one of the barely articulated themes of the Souls of Black Folk that the experience of black people in America, with all its horrors, may be part of what has prepared them for their past. One wonders if this isn't what he meant when he wrote in Dusk of Dawn many years later, quote, this race talk is, of course, a joke. And frequently, it has driven me insane and probably will permanently in the future. And yet, seriously and soberly, we black folk are the salvation of mankind. The placing of the Negro as a folk among folks presumes this implicit reference to the perspective of humanity. Black folk must find their place among the nations. That they have a place is what we might call Herder's premise. White America for the Bryce is composed of folks too, though, even though he later wrote an essay called The Souls of White Folk, which lumps them all together. And because white Americans came, as Du Bois was very clear, from different European nations, they represented different national principles. So Du Bois's reference is international and comparative in another way. Each group in the American congregation of nationalities is a local branch of a people whose character can be detected in its history elsewhere. This idea connects to Bois in Africa, but it connects Henry and William James, for example, to England. We're inclined nowadays to suppose that the mechanism of this attachment has to be a biological theory of race. Why else would Du Bois think that he had something in common with people raised in an entirely different culture and climate on a continent thousands of miles away, a continent on which in 1903 he had not as yet set foot. But we can tell at once from the easy movement back and forth between talk of race and talk of nation that Du Bois's conception of what accounted for the unity of the Negro people was not what we would now call biology. As we saw in Conservation of Races, he believed that the biological, or as he put it there, physical similarities weren't the crucial ones. What mattered, he said, you will recall, were the deeper differences, which are spiritual, psychical differences, geistic differences, undoubtedly based on the physical, but infinitely transcending them. In the same passage that we've already reviewed, he speaks of the members of the folk striving together 
for certain ideals of life. There is something important here in Du Bois' claim that race is matter because a racial identity allows people to work together for an ideal. Throughout his long life, Du Bois did believe that the people of a race had much naturally in common, much history they shared, but he always also thought that they had many common purposes, things to aim for. It's this that makes it quite proper to speak of his attitude to his racial identity as a form of nationalism. He believed about the Negro race, everything that an American patriot of his day would have believed about America, except that it needed a single country, a single nation state, to gather the people in. So he believed in a Negro national character and a Negro national destiny, just as Americans believed in an American national culture and a character and an American national destiny. And he thought it was the duty of black people, especially the most talented black people, to work together in the service of the Negro people, as an American patriot believed that it was the duty of Americans, especially the most talented Americans, to work together in the service of the American people. As he put it in the American Creed, in the Academy Creed, which ended the conservation of races, we believe that the Negro people as a race have a contribution to make the civilization of humanity which no other race can make. The Negro national character gave black people, black folk, special gifts. The gifts, as he called them, of the seventh son. But it was their duty to develop these gifts and deliver their contribution, not just to each other, but to mankind. There is a word for the character of the nationalism that Du Bois expressed. It is cosmopolitan. Even here, in defining his creed, he speaks not just of racial, but of human brotherhood. Du Bois is cosmopolitan too in his openness to the achievements of other civilizations, his celebration of European high culture and low culture. He's always open. In the souls of black folk, you see this in The Coming of John, and the black John is moved beyond measure by Wagner's music. Quote, he sat in dreamland and started when, after a hush, rose high and clear the music of Lerngrin's swan. The infinite beauty of the whale lingered and swept through every muscle of his brain and put it all at you. <coughs> the is cultural cosmopolitanism is equally evident in his citations, not just of German high culture, but of its folk culture as well, as when he quotes a German folk song in the final pages of the Souls of Black Folk. Yet scathe and spoonerly, clink of it. Now I'm going to the well, buying a drink. This is my translation. <coughs> the voice discuss cosmopolitanism is not just aesthetic. He accepts the fundamental cosmopolitan moral idea that whatever his duties to the Negro, he has obligations to those outside his racial horizon. And he's a methodological cosmopolitan, too, in his insistence, as I've been pointing out all along, on a globally comparative perspective, even when he appears to be talking just about the United States. Du Bois sees the problem of Jim Crow as part of a global tragedy. The color line imposes Jim Crow in Georgia, but it also imposes a destructive colonialism on Asia and Africa and the islands of the sea in its place. It's hard, I think, for most contemporary leaders to think of cosmopolitan nationalism as anything other than an oxymoron. Surely, the cosmopolitanism, the idea that all human beings are, in some sense, fellow citizens of the world, is the very opposite of nationalism, the conviction that the boundaries of nationality should be the boundaries of citizenship. And yet, as we shall see, this elegant argument is simply a mistake. It's not a mistake, however, that someone with Du Bois' intellectual background would have made. Friedrich Meinecke, who was only a little older than Du Bois, and like him, studied with Kreitschke, wrote, just five years after his Souls was published, quote, Cosmopolitanism and nationalism stood side by side in a close living relationship for a long time. Now, Meinecke says this in the context of a discussion with Johann Gottlieb Fichter, one of the key figures in the transition from Kant to Hegel, but the point he's making applies quite widely, both to philosophers and to practical patriots, which is why the book in which he makes it is called Cosmopolitanism and the National State. Anyone who's followed, as the Bois certainly did, the movements of nationalism in the 19th century Europe would have recognized the sentiments, for example, of Giuseppe Mazzini, the great Italian patriot, writing here in 1844 on, in his book, uh, Duties of 
man. Your first duties, first as regards the poor. Remember, this is a famous Italian patriotic nationalist, founder of modern Italian nationalism. Your first duty is, as I've already told you, not towards <laughs> humanity. You are men before you are either citizens or farmers. But what, each, what, what can each of you singly do for the moral improvement and progress of humanity? The individual is too insignificant and humanity too vast. The mariner of Brittany prays to God as he puts to sea, help me my God, my boat is so small and thy ocean so wide. And this prayer is the true expression condition of each one of you, until you find the means of infinitely multiplying your forces and powers of action. This means was provided for you by God when he gave you a country. European nationalism of the 19th century, at least in the elevated and philosophical formulations of the voice of the study, as in the form he experienced it more directly in Berlin, recognized that the demand for national rights only made sense as a whole that it was claimed equally for all peoples. Du Bois' defense of the Negro and of the legitimacy of Negroes, like himself having a higher degree of concern for their own kind, was always framed within the recognition both that they had obligations to people of other races and that they would gain greatly from conversation across the races. His nationalism, his partiality to the Negro, like Mazzini's Italian nationalism, never descended into chauvinism. When he is critical of white people, it is most often for a general failure to recognize and implement the universality of the very values they claim as their own. Du Bois always recognized, too, the risk of black folk facing a world in which so many of the white people they met would refuse contact with them would be forced into an uncosmopolitan withdrawal from the contact across nations and peoples, the contact the cosmopolitan claims is dignified and essential. He makes the point in Dusk of Dawn when he talks of the way American racism imprisons black people within the race. Practically, this group imprisonment within a group has various effects upon the prisoner. He becomes provincial and centered upon the problems of his particular group. He tends to neglect the wider aspects of national life and human existence. Du Bois was in his 70s when he published the book from which those words came. Notice that everything he says here about black people Enclosed within an American context can be equally said about Americans enclosed in a provincial nationalism within the wider world. The formulation is deliberately abstract. It's a critique of the anti cosmopolitan tendencies of nationalism that is completely general. And indeed, in his 1920 essay, The Souls of White Folk, he expressed pity for white Americans, quote, imprisoned and enthralled, hampered and made miserable by racism very much the same terms. Racism denied white people access to the souls and the riches of black folk. <coughs> Still, if this careful statement by the aging scholar is more sober and universal, it's also, I think, less moving than the way he expressed it part of his life uh, earlier in the Souls of Black Folk. There he spoke that the cosmopolitan instinct for conversation across peoples in these justly more famous words. I sit with Shakespeare, and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out the caves of evening and that swing between the strong limbed earth and the tracery of the stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius, and what soul I will. And they come all graciously, with no scorn nor condescension. So, when with truth, I dwell above the veil. In 1900, Du Bois said that the color line, the double problem of racism within the West and racial imperialism outside it, would be the problem of the 20th century. In the century of Hitler and of Stalin, of the Khmer Rouge and Putin's power, we cannot say that his exclusive focus on racism directed against people of color turned out to be justified. Indeed, I don't know if it's worth trying to decide what slogan would probably identify the problem of a century that had so many problems. But it was undeniably a century in which more of the cosmopolitan spirit, 
a little more respect, that is, for difference, and a little more concern for the moral interests of strangers would have made a huge difference for the better. The record of such prophecies is not great. But if I were asked for an enemy of hope for our new century, I would say it was anti-cosmopolitanism. One that has taken new forms in our time, but that already underlay the indifference and contempt for others that Du Bois referred to when he spoke of the problem of the color line. In reading Du Bois today, I'm struck by how much his spirit engages our new challenges. The world has changed in the centuries since the soul of that folk first appeared, but the spirit that animates it is, I believe, as relevant now as it was then. Like the boys, we cosmopolitans think we might learn something from those we disagree with. We think people have a right to their own lives. As John Stuart Mill said in one of my favorite passages from my favorite chapter of, on liberty, which happens to be my favorite book, if it were only that people have diversities of taste, that is reason enough for not attempting to shape them all after one model. But different persons also require different conditions for their spiritual development. Unless there is a corresponding diversity in their modes of life, they neither obtain their fair share of happiness, nor grow up to the mental, moral, and aesthetic statues of which their nature is capable. I always believe that deeply, too. And it's perhaps not so surprising. After all, the philosopher whose influence is most evident in omnipity is the same Wilhelm von Humboldt, who created the curriculum Du Bois studied at the Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin. I began with an anecdote about Du Bois and the Van Dorens, wondering out loud if what Mark Van Doren said was true. But it occurs to me that you might have wondered whether the anecdote itself was to be relied on. Well, if you want to know how I know this story, here's the answer. Charlie Van Doren told me. But that young man went on to edit the Encyclopedia Britannica, reshaping it into its final printed form in the generation before the encyclopedia's natural home moved from the printed page into the world of the digital. And I got to know him because he helped my friend Skip Gates and I set out to achieve one of the boys' dreams, the creation of the cosmopolitan encyclopedia of the African diaspora. The Encarta Africana, in its five volume print companion, available from Oxford University Press for $595, <laughs> is uh, dedicated to the voice. But it shares this dedication with an element Nelson Rohilala Mandela. W.B. Du Bois was not famous for sharing. But I think he would have been pleased that an encyclopedia of the black experience should bring together a cross of prince who led the democratic movement that ended the last colonial state in Africa, and a boy from Great Barrington who struggled as that prince did, never to let racism provincialize him. Du Bois, like Mandela, never succumbed to the twin temptations that he had written of in the moving account of Alexander Crummel in The Soul of the Black Folk. Despair, constant obstruction of his ambitions, doubt in the capacity of black people. He never succumbed to that despair. He never succumbed to that, uh, took up with that doubt. And I think it's fitting to pair these men in one final way. Du Bois is scarcely, scarcely forgotten, of course, but he is surely no longer the most famous Negro in the world. Despite the black movie stars and the black sports superstars and the black megastars of music, I would like to that mantle has passed to Nelson Mandela. And if it has, then somewhere up there beyond the veil, William Edward Burger Du Bois, I think, is savoring the spectacle.
doubled this. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a dark side of cosmopolitanism too, right? I think. And the dark form of cosmopolitanism is the form that entirely loses any uh, uh, local attachments. Um, um, I love, I think the best formulation of this is, is, uh, is by um, uh, uh, Alice P. Douglas' uh, friend, Gertrude uh, uh, Stein, who said, uh, who said, what use are roots if you don't take them with you? Uh, <laughs> that is challenging the nationalist, pick, uh, the point of the nationalist uh, appeal to roots is the idea, well, they're going to hold you down, they're going to stop you. Uh, she was reinterpreting, reinterpreting nationalist sort of metaphor in a cosmopolitan way, but she wasn't rejecting, she wasn't rejecting roots. She was just saying, you can in some sense, take it with you. Now that, that destroyed the national guys at that point. I don't want to try to take it any further. But I think, uh, but, it, but it represents the challenge. The challenge is to, is to, is, is to leaven, uh, leaven the, the, the dark side of universality with, with particularity and locality, and to leaven the dark side of locality and particularity with sufficient universality. And, you, and that's what you'd expect a philosopher to say, right? I mean, that's the great challenge. Yes. One of the strategies to overcome racism is to challenge the concept of race itself. I know you've done some work on this. Do you want to illuminate this idea? Sir? Yes. I mean, uh, I mean, the voice is very interesting in this regard because his official position from very early on, from at least from 1911, when he reports on the proceedings of the Universal Race Congress, uh, Used of those proceedings. Uh, his official position is that science is a scientific, is a race is a scientific nonsense. That's his official position. He says so. He's one of the first people to be clear about this. I mean, Boas is working in anthropology to turn this into the basis of a new way of doing anthropology at that point. But, but this is in the crisis. This is in a national magazine addressed to her, the educated reading public, and he's saying you have to understand what these people are saying amounts to telling us that. Whatever, however we're going to understand race, we can't understand it as a scientific problem. And that's why he talks about transcending or deeper or all these metaphors of avoiding the idea that the race, whatever it is, is properly encompassed by a, a biological or a, maybe says a physical understanding. Um, now, you could uh, respond to the thought that uh, it's not a scientific by, by just abandoning it. Right? You could say, look, if race is, uh, phlogiston isn't a scientific concept, so we don't talk about phlogiston. Race isn't a scientific concept, so we shouldn't talk about race. And I was myself tempted, I think, by that move. Uh, I was young, vigorous, inclined to contentiousness. Um, <laughs> but I think the trouble with it is that um, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I think the, the scientific part of the claim is correct. I do not think that we, we have to keep having this argument because the science keeps changing and people who work on the Human Genome Project keep insisting that somewhere in there they're going to find this, the secret that will unlock the story and finally allow us to tell a scientific story about race, and I don't believe them. Uh, and so I have to learn things about the new racial biology in order to continue the argument. But suppose, just grant that I'm right about that. Just, uh, you know, whatever you have to think about the about science. Suppose I, suppose I were right. I think it would be a mistake to conclude <coughs> that there isn't important work to be done by a concept of racial something. And I think my favorite way of putting this is to speak of racial identities. And is to say that there are no races, but there are racial identities. <laughs> Now, identities have a general property, a general feature, which is falsehoods can be crucial parts of their constitution. Uh, this is absolutely characteristic of nationalism. Uh, national identities are almost always involved uh, nonsense of various sorts uh, as part of their constitutive uh, ideology, uh, whether it's beliefs about the origin uh, where the Houthis came out of the ground here and the, and the Tutsis didn't, or whether it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, the myth that uh, Jefferson believed in, in freedom, uh, which you may still be uh, 
trapped within, um, there are falsehoods central to the other sort of national self identity. But that doesn't mean that there isn't, the, that doesn't mean there's no, there's no Hutu identity, it doesn't mean there's no American identity, the fact that the story is tied up with falsehoods. And I think the same is true, uh, you know, must be true, therefore, about racial identities. That is to say, often people's racial identities are tied up with beliefs about biology that are false. But that doesn't make the racial, that doesn't make the identity unreal in, in social life. And that's because, um, provided there's some consensus about who's in and who's out. That is, provided the social group has uh, not sharp, but uh, relatively well-defined boundaries, then uh, it can act collectively, it can be responded to as a collectivity, and its members can make demands on each other, and outsiders can respond to its members as members. And those are the sorts of things that make a social identity real everyday life. And that's, so it seems to me um, one can combine the claim that there's no such thing as a sensible biological accounting <coughs> which will divide the world into races in the way that social life divides the, the world into races, and still say that the world is divided in these rough and ready ways into uh, social groups, and that they have an importance for social life. Now, what you can't predict in any of these cases is what happens to the identity when the truth begins to be assimilated, whether the truth is about biology or about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and, and nor is there any obvious answer to what should happen when the truth is assimilated. When people learn new things about things, they have to decide how to handle the world, and they respond in all kinds of ways, and it's not up to philosophers or anybody else to tell them what they should be doing. So uh, my, my thought is that racial identities are obviously being reconfigured all the time, in part in response to changes in social life. We don't have Jim Crow anymore. We don't have formal legal segregation in the United States. This makes a difference to the meaning of racial identities. Also, we have different thoughts about racial identity. We have less, I think, less widespread conviction of, in, in the, on the sort of centrality of biology, much more tendency to think in, in sort of culturalist terms. About these, these make a difference. So, so the thing shifts. And because of the way in which identities work in, the, in our mental lives, which is that we, they provide uh, tools for our self-construction, uh, what it is to be a black person in the United States today, what it is for me to be a black person, is being changed as the meaning of the identity is being changed by these changing practices. And so what it can mean to me is changing. And so it has to be sort of re-described and re-imagined by me, but also by everybody else, uh, sort of all the time. I have a question that follows up on that and, and um, applies it to Du Bois. I think it seems in your presentation that that is an interesting contradiction, and that's not a bad thing, but a sort of productive contradiction within Du Bois's own project, which is on the one hand you say he advocates in the sort of 19th century tradition that the more you cultivate your own originality and individuality as a person, but also as a group, the more you have to bring to the table of humanity, basically. That's the way to go. You, and um, on the other hand, um, if he had done that consistently, <laughs> I guess he would have stayed at home and would have tried to be as black as possible in his thought and everything. Instead, he went to Germany <laughs> and just loaded himself up with German philosophy, culture, music, arts, and, and all that kind of stuff, and, and ended up writing the most influential book on black identity by being totally, or not totally, but, but very much intellectually a hybrid, a hybrid, and not as originally and purely African-American as possible. So there seems to be some kind of a, right. um, um, uh, um, You know, Du Bois has a way of thinking about hybridity, which is in this talk about Tunis, which <coughs> the doubleness of being African and American black and American at the same time, a Negro and American, a Negro, uh, you know, two striped souls in one dark body and so on. Um, and that, that's, that again is, is not, I mean, that's part of the discourse, that idea of doubleness, I think, is to be found in other American writers, in other writers in other places. Um, my own, um, My, 
wide distance from Duplois is a distance is a distance from. Uh, uh, I guess I'm I'm, I'm, I'm less uh, drawn to the nationalist side of the of the dialectic than I think he was. And the problem you identify is really a problem for the nationalist side, uh, which is one of the founding. <coughs> mistakes of modern nationalism, which is to understand nationalities as constituted entirely from within. Uh, whereas, especially if you're thinking of cultural nationalism, especially if you're thinking of a nation that in some sense constituted by a Schrafgeist or a Volksgeist or something, um, its content is always Include stuff from outside the boundaries of the nation state. Uh, German, the German high culture that, that, that is the framing context for nationalism, German na literary nationalism, uh, inclu is, includes people, for example, whose intellectual formation um, was deeply connected, obviously, with classical antiquity, with the Greeks and the Romans, and in the case of Goethe, with the reading of uh, the West Pacific of Ivan is about, it draws on uh, his understanding, anyway, of Persian poetry. Um, you can't understand who Shakespeare is if you are not allowed to talk about um, Roman narratives, uh, Italian sonnets, uh, and so on. Uh, you can't read really Pushkin, great founder of Russian, from Russian literature, Russian literature at all. Is one quarter Ethiopian. That's preposterous. Japan uses Chinese script. And its major religion is India. Uh, and the Buddhism and the Shintoism, which is a national cult. But the Zen Buddhism, the Buddha, was an Indian. So, you know, I don't think you can do it in any case. So that the very idea of a kind of pure national something or other that you're passing on, that's always an imaginary thing. Uh, and I don't think you need that imaginary thing in order to, I mean, that's, I think you can have a kind of nationalism, a kind of patriotism that isn't committed to that view, that's a, that's a sort of uh, more relaxed kind of nationalism, uh, one that identifies patriotism in a sort of American way with um, a kind of civic religion that is a respect for certain constitutional principles and so on, which can be seen as you know, having an internal history but also having connections with histories in other places. So what? They're still there the ones we are currently committed to living by uh, within the framework of, of the laws. And I think that way of thinking about the nation is consistent as it is in standard framings of, of our civic religion with thinking of the nation as itself a product of the incoming of many nations. I just, I just think it's ironic. Um, let's say it's uh, uh, this idea of racial variance that's not scientifically determined. It just it seems to me, you know, the, the question of the nation, the question of a racial they're all, I wouldn't say they're all mixed. They're all, you know, 
two different issues that you're, you're bringing together here. One is a set of issues about the role of untruth in identity, right? Um, there, my view is just, you know, untruths are what you can live by. Philosophers don't like it, but it's just a fact. Uh, we, we live by what we believe in. Uh, we can live by what we believe in, even if it isn't true. Uh, and identities often have things that aren't true, except for them, but that doesn't, make, doesn't mean that people aren't living by it. It creates problems for people who are, have some sense of identification, but who recognize the untruth. That is true. Right. So if I, if I understand the... Uh, if I, I'm historically... Actually, you know, Renaud said this in his wonderful essay, Discrimination, what is the nation, you know, from more than 100 years ago. Um, he said, he said uh, historical study is often a threat to the principle of nationality. That's what he meant. If you know the truth, it's a bit like, you know, his marks about uh, politics and sausages. That you won't like either of them if you know how they're actually made. Um, uh, better not to know. Better not to know. Once you know the truth, once, once you have the complex truth about our country, say, that these, these men who spoke so movingly at liberty went home and had their tea poured by slaves and had their farms, their plantations, and sold. I mean, that's a, that's a more complicated story. And, and people who know the truth, who know the complicated story, who know about Sally Hemings as well as about the Declaration of Independence. Um, have to have a more complicated relation to their identity. So that's one point about truth. But the other point, I think, is just that uh, uh, human beings are creatures who manage complex pulls from many identities. It's something that everybody knows how to do. Sometimes it causes problems because sometimes people uh, make a demand on you in the name of an identity that's inconsistent with the demand that you is either based in some other identity or that is based in morality. Sometimes people ask you to do things for them as an X that you shouldn't do not as a something, but just because you shouldn't do it. Right. You, you know, be loyal to the team, but the team's doing something terrible. Morality requires me to be disloyal to the team. That happens all the time. Um, but, but in general, people know how to do it. In, in, in my father's house, I discuss example with my father who knew how the fact that he was a Methodist, the fact that he believed in the ancestors, the fact that he was a Pan-Africanist, the fact that he was a Ghanaian patriot, the fact that he was an Asante loyalist, the fact that he was a believer in the monarchy of Asante and also in democracy in Ghana, all of these things, which I suppose might sound inconsistent, um, he managed perfectly happily when he, he knew that when he was in being an elder of the Methodist Church, he thought he knew how to, how to uh, he knew that he was uh, among people who were fellow uh, sons, of, uh, sons of men, the children of God, and so it didn't matter whether you were a Santi or a Ghana or an African or a European, but uh, when it came to uh, you know, dealing with our relations with Nigeria, that he was you know, apt to uh, defend the Ghana and interests. And we can all do that. We all know that, that it's, it's good to, um, you know, uh, loyalty to one's school, right, is, has its place. But we don't think it should trump uh, morality, we don't think it should trump legal obligations, and so on. We're very good at recognizing the demands of identity and stacking them up. Now, of course, contexts arise in which people <coughs> have to make choices. And uh, but that would be true if we didn't have identity. Moral life is complicated. There are, there are always trying to do I think identities, um, and I don't think that there's anything very helpful to be said in a general way about, in an abstract way, about how to resolve these things. Right? And that is to say, you know, give me the details of the story, and I can give you a bunker of advice about you know, how to manage it if I understand what your concerns are how your identifications work. <coughs>
you're saying, I'm first of this and second of that. It's contextual. In some contexts, one matters more in another context. Uh, so that won't help. You can't rank them independently of context. Um, so that, that's all on the second point. The, second. the first point is we live, with, we live by what we believe, not by the truth. Uh, of course, what we believe, we believe to be true. But uh, usually, uh, yeah, 70 percent of it's right on topics that we have some knowledge of, and the other 30 percent is wrong. And if we knew which was which, we could figure it out. Thank you.